Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to our webcast here today. James Hilliard on board as the host for this presentation, brought to you by Cisco. Uh, really happy, and you'll see him on screen with me here. Adam Tomio is on board, Product Marketing Manager for Cisco Secure Endpoint, 15 plus years in this space, information technology and services industry. Currently at Cisco, focuses on those secure endpoint solutions. And we'll talk about more of that, especially a bit later on in our presentation. We're going to go about 30 minutes or so here with all of you today. But we'll talk about how uh, those endpoint solutions and that security offering from Cisco today, very active. And that's different from a lot of the old school passive models that we've had when it comes to security. We're going to be talking a lot about endpoints. Adam and I uh, had this on our calendar, and then all of a sudden we got given, kind of Adam, I hate saying it, we got given a gift. Because uh, we're going to be talking about ransomware at a higher level and this and that. And all of a sudden, this log4j vulnerability starts getting out there last December and just caused a whole lot of sleepless nights for a lot of organizations. And I know a lot of people are still saying, are we protected? Have we protected ourselves? How deep is this? I mean, this was, was everywhere. So what we want to do, folks, is break down. I'll break down really kind of what we're going to do for that half hour or so. We'll take a couple minutes up front, and we're just going to give it to Adam. And he's going to break us down what it was where it's at, kind of State of the Union on Log4j. Then we'll break it out into a little bit more of what's the general ransomware landscape and threat vectors today as it stands. So we'll get a little bit broader. And then we're going to talk into some concepts. And this is an area where we hope to give you some uh, ideas about some conversations and things that you can continue talking about within the walls of your organization. Then, of course, reach out to Cisco and others as needed uh, for support. But we'll talk about uh, the idea of SASE, which I know a lot of you are focused on. We're going to talk about zero trust. So a lot of good topic areas we're going to go back and forth on, and we'll get more into that. But, but Adam, first off, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is an exciting time for everybody and, you know, happy to be talking about Log4j, talk a little bit about ransomware and talk about some high level uh, security strategies that a lot of folks are interested, in, especially with, you know, remote work and XDR and all these great terminologies and four letter acronyms that are coming out. And we're going to break those acronyms down for everyone. That's one of the things that we want to do here today as well. Is make sure we're all speaking the same language and understand what's going on there. But let's do this. Let's, I had mentioned we'll take about, you know, five minutes or so, give or take, on this log4j, kind of what it was, where it is, what the kind of current state is. So let me throw it to you for a couple minutes on that. We'll, folks, we'll run through a couple slides that you can follow along, really kind of get an understanding there. And then again, we'll start broadening up the, uh, the conversation. But log4j, where are we at, Adam? So we're going to spend a little bit of time kind of talking about Log4j, what it is, what happened with it uh, from, a, from a flow. Next, we'll talk about the impact. We'll talk a little bit about the mitigation and the migrations that are happening and, and mitigations that are occurring. Then we'll talk a little bit about what that compromise looked like and why this is you know, such a potential challenge. So starting out very high level, Apache Log4j is a Java-based logging utility that's part of the Apache logging services. So it's a part of the uh, Apache Software Foundation. So Log4j is one of several Java logging frameworks. And so this logging thing is extremely important for developing teams because it helps to record the activities of an application, which can be used for a lot of different things, including debugging, uh, performance improvement, and auditing and compliance. You know, and logging frameworks make it easier for developers to standardize the process. So the good thing is, you, you know, using these logging services negates the need to explicitly, you know, output to a console. And then all the storage, all these logs becomes independent, and the code can therefore be customized at runtime. So now we kind of get that high level. On Thursday, December 9th, okay, so 2021, I trying to remember my years, the Apache Software Foundation disclosed a security vulnerability in a widely used Java software library called Log4j, hence the name. This vulnerability is referred to as a zero-day exploit because it was shared with everyone at the same time, the public, vendors, customers. You know, on Twitter, along with software code, uh, it was referred to as explicit code to take advantage of this bug that can infiltrate and affect the product. So now one thing to understand is Log4j is an open source software. So that means that it can be used freely around the world by software developers including you know us cisco and i'll raise our hand on that because it was part of our uh back it was part of our logging tools as well so as you talk about that let's talk about that log4j impact so 
if you're not well versed in software development, you might think of it as a process involving, you know, guys typing away on their keyboards, writing that code from scratch. But in fact, most of the software development process involves taking code from other sources that's already written and packaged together. You know, for the most part, it's a good and efficient developer won't waste their time, you know, writing these basic functions like logging into things like networking protocols, you know, web calls, and they'll lever leverage other existing frameworks like Log4j. So Log4j is in an ecosystem where these code packages for logging files. It was developed by Apache and it's essentially designed to take data from an app and save it elsewhere. It's a feature that was added in 2013 as the origin, as the origin of this vulnerability, but today it's still unknown whether this is an accident or added with you know, malintent by a bad actor. So what this really means to business leaders when they think about purchasing software products is that they're actually getting an assemblage of components that the vendor has stitched together or coded together to do certain things. And it's rare for a software company to have written every single line of code in their product that your business has purchased. You know, from a CISO standpoint, you need to understand that the security risks posed by a collection of software products that make up these packages and that the average consumer and end user community are unfortunately at the mercy of these companies that are updating their software. You know, especially when they're talking about things like, you know, freeware or, or you know, these, these uh, open sources. You know, and for businesses and especially CISOs, this frightening new vulnerability highlights the importance of having a solid cybersecurity strategy and a holistic view into your technical environment. So, you know, the, the, the caveat of this is many business leaders are still asking, you know, what does this mean for us? And the answer basically is, we still don't know yet. So as you talk about it, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, a lot of people burned a lot of candles in the midnight hours and long weekends and nights and uh, have managed to get us to a point where we can talk about mitigation. So, you know, despite there being some confusion about the increasing number of vulnerabilities related to the log 4J security flaw, there was actually up to three at some point. You'll see all three CVEs listed here. I won't read them by name because it gets a little long. Um, Cisco's advice to users and network defenders remains the same. You know, for the largest segment of users, uh, JNDI, or the Java Naming and Directory Interface, represents an unnecessary risk. So we suggest disabling this feature so that the threat surface is unavailable. And then Cisco also says we recommend updating to log4j 2.17.0, which is the latest version, which also disables that JNDI by default. So this whole new log 4J 2.17.0 uh, is the most recent patch and was released. And it basically fixes those three CVEs by disabling the JNDI like we talked about. It requires the log 4J system to properly set up to allow a true JNDI. It completely removes the support for message lookups. And it also protects from infinite recursion in a lookup evaluation. So to prevent denial of service attacks. So again, as long as you're moving forward with this and staying up to date on that latest update and a lot of these patchings, you're gonna be pretty much in a lot safer spot. So as we talk about the compromise, this is where things start to get really uh, interesting. This is a, and I've gotta give credit to Purple Box. Thank you very much, guys, if you are actually hearing this. This is the greatest design of kind of what's happening and why this is happening or what could happen. In the green above, you're seeing the happy user in a normal log4j scenario where he's you know, putting in information and it's coming into the HTTP server and it gets logged into the HTML request. What's happening is with the exfiltration attack is that the attacker is allowed to retrieve a payload from the remote server and execute it locally. So this vulnerability can be triggered to retrieve and execute you know, malicious class files. So it resides in that JNDI like we were talking about. An implementation can be triggered through using an, you know, an LDAP request or a lightweight directory access protocol request. So as he's putting information in or that request is in and the logging happens, they're loading that with a payload that actually will execute uh, on that LDAP server and then it can push back for the exfiltration and all of a sudden they're in. And this is quite easy, quite fast and quite painless to do. So that kind of gives an idea of, 
you know, what's happening with the log4j compromise and why it's so important that you are up to date on that latest patch, that 2.17.0, uh, in order to make sure that you're patched. Because now we're also seeing in the wild that uh, malicious actors moving on to kind of leading up here uh, have started to use that exploit. Uh, Conti as a ransomware or as a as a organization has already started to leverage this log4j uh, as a ransomware you know springboard into your environment. So that kind of wraps up log4j as I can see it. Is there anything that you want me to add? Really, the only thing that that I had seen and read uh, out there is is this is one of those that impacted small, large manufacturing, financial services. Healthcare, any vertical you can think of, any business you're in, if if basically you use software in any capacity, potentially this is an issue for you. And that's why this grabs so many headlines. And that's why this was so worrisome is because just everybody that and because it's a logging mechanism, it's just copying things. And so you could have copies of this just all over the place. That that was my understanding at a very, you know, uh, general level. But that's why this got so much attention. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And and again, it's that kind of open source and uh, code guys are, that are writing for applications aren't going to spend time writing logging scripts. They're just going to take, hey, Apache Log4j because you're, you know, the industry standard on open source for that. We'll just borrow you. And yeah. it's the default kind of a thing. And so you're putting your business at risk uh, as a developer but you're also putting the business at risk of those that buy your software, you know, again, and it's, you know, we don't know if it's malintent or if it was just a, a huge accidental oops, but no matter what, it's just, it's, you know, the pervasiveness of, especially with open source things like this, uh, it gets crazy. Yeah. It's an opinion question here for you, Adam, but is this going to be something that is going to change a lot of developers mindsets for a while where they might be like, okay, we might still borrow the code, but we're going to really go through it a little bit more again. We're going to go back and review some of these things that we've just been using. I think you said 2013 first version here. So, you know, we've been using this for a decade. Uh, are you going to do, do we expect more people are going to go back and be like, all right, let's just double check that code. Let's make sure that we don't have something like this pop back up again or what, what do you think is going to be an impact on, on the software development world? My hope would be that guys go back and check that and cross check and, and you know, really run uh, some, some serious code testing against it for vulnerabilities. Uh, but at the same time, realizing that we live in such a SaaS world right now, for me, it's I can push out an update and think about your mobile apps on your phone. They update daily, weekly, yeah. sometimes twice a week. Uh, it's going to turn so fast that you wouldn't even know whether or not you were vulnerable at that moment or what you were vulnerable for. It's not the same as having to get, you know, a, a three and a half floppy. Well, I'm going to date myself um, and having to update your, your operating system that way or, or you know, updating you know, uh, your office programs for that matter, your productivity tools through disk or it, it's automatically done. So I have a feeling that it's going to start tightening up. That's just me. But at the same time, it's moving so quickly now that and software publishers are on the gun of, you know, get more out, get more productive, get faster, get, you know, less cumbersome or, and so I don't, it's roll the dice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, and, 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 and again, it's, it's also one of those that there may be focused for a little while, but anyone that's listening to us now that's been in IT for any amount of time knows that, oh, good, this happened. Okay, let's focus, let's focus. And then we forget about it, something else, unfortunately. So that I think is a good transition to that something else because you can't just spend all day. And I, I read stories. There were a couple out there of, you know, folks that were just cramming through code and trying to find all the stuff, sleep for an hour or two, back up and doing, I mean, there was some real, panic by some organizations out there trying to mitigate this. Uh, but you can't only focus on log4j. Ransomware in general is still a big scourge. That's why we've been planning this conversation regardless of log4j to talk about where we stand kind of in 2022 and moving forward some of the mentality that we want companies adopting uh, in terms of their security posture. We'll get to that in a little bit. Let's broaden out to you. And I know you got a couple more slides here that you want to share on just what is our state of the union of ransomware 
in general. To me, it's still one of the top priorities that folks are, are dealing with on the security front for, again, organizations, large, small, any vertical. Perfect. And thank you for that transition, too. Uh, guys, you know, part of my charter, and I'll uh, uncover or, you know, let you guys know on it. Uh, part of my charter for fiscal year, Cisco's fiscal year is ransomware. And so I've been following this, uh, you know, like a bloodhound or, or you know, a, a detective for the past few months, uh, you know, actually all the way back into 2021. But if we talk about this, there were 250 attacks in 2020. These are just published attacks. These are ones that people have gone out and said, yep, we're a victim. Uh, not counting all the ones that we don't know about. In 2021, there were 292. So it's 117% year over year increase. And we're just starting in 2022 now. So uh, I will be updating this slide as we go. So if you guys ever catch me later on, this is you know, one of my passion slides to talk about. Did you guys realize that the first new variant in 2021 was uh, the very first week of January? So Babu Locker came out in early January, first week. So you obviously know that the bad guys didn't take Christmas and New Year's off. They were out there ready to roll and ready to hit you when you're least when you're in your most vulnerable, when you're just coming back in and your email's full and all those kind of things. Give you guys a snapshot into December. So December was one of the busiest months of 2021. There were 33 ransomware attacks being publicly recorded. There were several high profile attacks, including a car manufacturer, Volvo, who lost their R&D when they were hit with ransomware. And Nordic Choice Hotels, whose guests found themselves locked out of their hotel rooms following an attack by the Conti gang. There's that reference to the Conti guys again. So hopefully we can get those guys behind bars at some point. Uh, similar to Revel that just happened. Uh, perhaps the most interesting was an incident at a tech company, Assurian, where a former disgruntled employee stole a company laptop and exfiltrated data before posing as an anonymous ransomware hacker, and they extorted them out of $300,000. So, guys, you know, and, and there was a few years back where people were saying ransomware is done, ransomware is over, uh, no more is going to see any more ransomware, and that kind of thing. Uh, but unfortunately, ransomware keeps uh, becoming the top threat of the quarter. So those of you that follow Cisco Talos in our threat intelligence group, uh, the quarterly trends that happened in August of last year, I have to update this one, but it has been the top threat of the quarter, quarter after quarter after quarter. Uh, obviously, with the log4j, that's going to move up in the list. But that's a vulnerability, and the vulnerability becomes exploited through ransomware, and that's where the bad stuff starts happening again. Uh, and I know that similarly, when we're talking about the the the, uh, the exploitability of Log4j across all the verticals, the same thing's happening, guys, with ransomware. No verticals are safe. Uh, it's just they everybody is a potential victim at this point, or every kind of vertical is a potential victim. You know, what we're seeing is we're seeing a combination of, you know, new and old variants. So Revel obviously just got shut down. Uh, the Russian government arrested them. Conti we know of. Uh, Ryuk is coming out big. Dark Side is huge again right now. They're coming out and they're, they're making a pretty big footprint. Uh, and then lastly, as we talk about it, uh, you know, talk about these three initial vectors. You know, vulnerabilities is the top initial vector. Log4j, uh, phishing emails, and then account compromise. And you got to think about account compromise. It's not necessarily just you sitting at your desk working for the company that pays you every week. It can also be you know, from a vendor who has access to your organization. So it could be you know, your support group, your finance group, or anybody else that you might outsource, or any other vendors that you have coming in or logging in and have access into your systems can present uh, can present an initial vector for ransomware to come in so it gets a little uh, haywire if you stop to think about because those three are kind of potent so real quick uh, and then we'll kind of keep flowing along here but you know think about this is your your top 10 list of ways to protect against ransomware one you know back up all your data you know so make sure you have an enterprise data backup solution that can scale and won't experience bottlenecks when the time comes you know, patch your systems, log4j, uh, make it a habit of updating your software regularly, 
you know, patching the commonly exploited third-party software will foil a lot of attacks. Uh, enable multi-factor authentication. This is the weakest link in the security chain is usually human. So, you know, educate your users on who and what to trust. Uh, protect your network. So take a layered approach to your network with security infused from the endpoint to email to the DNS layer. Uh, segment your network access. So that way you limit the resources that an attacker can access. Uh, keep an eye on the network security and the network activity because you can be able to see you know, activity across your network and data center can help you uncover attacks that bypass the perimeter. Uh, prevent initial infiltration. So most ransomware infiltrations occur through an email attachment and a malicious download. So diligently block those malicious websites and emails and attachments through layered security. Uh, arm your endpoints. So obviously antivirus solutions don't suffice anymore. So set up your privileges to so perform tasks as granting appropriate network access or permission to endpoints. And then obviously the two-factor authentication will also help there. Uh, get real-time threat intelligence. Obviously you gotta know your enemy. You know, Take advantage of threat intelligence from organizations like Talos to understand the, the latest security information and become more you know, aware of emerging cybersecurity threats. And then the last one is engage with an incident response specialist. You know, incident response teams provide the full suite of proactive and emergency services to help you prepare. You know, and, and I can't say this enough, guys, too. It's plan for it. Test your plan. You know, whether it's testing your backups or testing your IR response times or, or you know, or testing your plan. Make sure all of these work because when the time comes, if you haven't tested it, you don't know if you're going to come back from this at all with, you know, little wounds, big wounds, or if you just have to close the front doors to your business and call it a day. So and that's test everything. Yeah, and, 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 it, and, and I'll get into some of the mentality because that's where we do want to spend some of the conversation here, folks, in a little bit. It's talking about the mentality, the, a, a secure mentality and mindset. Um, you know, I've, I've talked uh, to many people over many years, Adam, all about the, the security space. It's obviously been a growing area of conversation. Um, and it used to be a matter, you know, you would talk about, oh, it's not, not a matter of if, but when you might be compromised. But that's gone further with a couple guys I talk to now, and it's, they don't talk about when in the future you may be compromised. It's when in the past did you get compromised and you still don't know about it because you don't have some of that insight or you haven't been going back in there and testing against things or you have, and, and that's the challenge. Now, technology has come a long way. And I do want to talk about some of the Cisco offerings because a lot of these things on the checklist here can be addressed by technology, right? They can, uh, you know, by, by segmenting our network access, right? Uh, real time threat intelligence, right? Those are things that we can utilize. But there are things like just patching the systems. Part of that's a human issue because it's prioritizing. Have we still done this? Are we all worried about this and we forgot about that? And so it's having this mentality of, of checking, double checking, triple checking. Now we got to go back and do it again to make sure that we didn't miss some update, some patch, some new exploit to a known vulnerability. But maybe that vulnerability really hadn't been attacked yet. But hey, now six months down the road, it is being attacked because someone got around to, hey, let's make that, that threat to it. Um, so there's a lot there. On, on the Cisco front, let's talk a little bit high level of how some of the tools from Cisco can address that checklist that you just went through. So great. So uh, real quick, just, you know, here's my commercial. Sorry. Uh, so Cisco Secure and Ransomware, we got a couple of things up on here, and I've got one that uh, did not make the final cut, but it will make this conversation. Uh, you better believe it. So, you know, you know, obviously ransomware protection works best when it's intelligence driven and fights threats on multiple fronts. So this requires kind of that platform based approach, such as, you know, Cisco SecureX that delivers that broad visibility across critical uh, control points to detect and protect at scale. So I've got six products up here right now that I'm just sharing with, and I'm going to add one more, like I said, at the bottom. So uh, email ransomware protection, Cisco secure email blocks ransomware delivered through spam and phishing emails. It can identify malicious attachments and URLs. Uh, you got web ransomware protection. So, you know, a lot of ransomware attacks use DNS. So we got Cisco umbrella that provides that fast and easy way to improve your security and help security visibility detect compromised systems and protects users on and off the network by stopping those threats over any port or protocol before they reach the network or the endpoints. 
obviously endpoint for ransomware protection, you know, Cisco secure endpoint, you know, it never really stops monitoring all the endpoint activity. So if it sees ransomware that unfolds, it can rapidly terminate the offending process and then prevents endpoint encryption and stops the ransomware attack in its tracks. Uh, ransomware investigation and response, and we'll dig into this. I know I'm, this is a teaser reel for you. Uh, Cisco SecureX is a cloud native built-in platform that connects all of our uh, Cisco Secure portfolio to your infrastructure. This is that XDR that everybody's touting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, I know, coming up. But it allows you to radically you know, reduce your dwell time with human-powered tools. Uh, Cisco Talus Incident Response. So, guys, we heard about it before with the intelligence and getting to know more about what's on top. You know, they developed ransomware plan of action specifically for incident response, and it's been tested and validated. So if you need an organization to come in and, and actually help you with your IR from plan to actually your hair's on fire, uh, reach out to those folks. Uh, Cisco Secure Access by Duo. So protects against ransomware by preventing adversaries from using stolen credentials. So now we're talking about, excuse me, two-factor authentication and multi-factor authentication. So Duo prevents, you know, potentially compromised device from accessing resources. And then last one is a network ransomware protection. You know, Cisco Secure Network Analytics. It delivers that agentless network detection and response solution. So this is the other half to XDR, you know, of your network traffic and sees when something anomalous occurs, like a ransomware infection. And then it uses, you know, multi-layer machine learning and uh, entity modeling to detect ransomware. So you're quick to able to accelerate your response and stop those attacks as well. So that's kind of a quick platform. Now, there was an announcement that we made back in 2020 where Cisco actually purchased Kenna Security. Uh, and then we spent half a second here on this because it's actually being integrated into our products uh, at a higher level. Now you understand that most risk scores when you're talking about CVSS are rated up to 100 uh, or 10. And it's, you know, depending on the, the, the exploit vulnerability, they get rather high. Uh, Log4j is actually a very high exploit or a very high CVSS number. Uh, when you're talking about it, as you add in Kenna, what Kenna did is they took those uh, CVSS scores, but they also look at your environment because your environment might not have anything that had log4j in it or some other exploit that's out or available. And so it's not that critical to you. So now by being able to combine uh, the threat intelligence from the outside world, plus the what do you have in your environment, what's critical to your business, those two combined gives a Kenna risk score. And that Kenna risk score tells you and it helps you identify, and you were talking about a minute ago, is the priority. What do I do first? What patches do I need to get done that have the most impact on my business? And it might not be something that the rest of the world is worried about because your environment looks a little bit different. Right. So it, it, it does allow you to prioritize. So I wanted to make sure I talked about Kenna Security for a minute. It's a great you know, add-on that we have now through, available through Cisco. Well, and that is one of the things a lot of the teams that I talk to, not in the, the, the vendor world, but on the, 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 the consumer companies, the companies that are consuming uh, Cisco technologies to help secure them and all. The, 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 the CISOs I talk to, the IT folks I talk to are like, sometimes we just don't know where to go. So it's like Buckshot, just trying to get everything. And they're doing a little bit of everything, which is really doing a whole lot of nothing, is some of the conversation I get from people. And so they want to know, where do I start? Which one do I have to focus on? Um, part of that leads into this idea of zero trust. I'm going to give you a little bit of, of kind of my definition, but I want to hear your definition and the Cisco mindset around zero trust and how you try and help organizations that you engage with to adopt this zero trust. It used to be, hey, trust but verify, right? That was the word. If, if you have kids out there, I have three kids. I tell my kids all the time, hey, you can trust something, but, but it's okay to also verify it. Within the world of zero trust, when it comes to tech, it's like you got to assume, even though that is a brand new thing, software, server, whatever it is, you have to assume there's something wrong with it. And then you have to verify it. That's the zero trust model. It's unfortunate that's where we're at, but that is the model that we just have to say, we're just not sure, so let's find out. And once we find out, then yes, we can move forward. That's my definition. Am I close to the Cisco definition and how you lead out with customers on this? Absolutely. You, you, you know, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. 
uh, just you know, taking a minute here to talk a little bit about it and think about it from from three kind of key W's or three works, if you will. You've got zero trust with the workforce. So now this is, am I, you know, trusting of the people that are involved in this? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Or are they real? Or are they compromised? So think about it like Cisco Secure Access by Duo. Think about things like Umbrella or Secure Endpoint or Any Connect or a lot of our different product groups here. It's talking about securing the workforce. It's people to people. It's people into the organization. You know, then you move to the second W. Hey, we've now got workload. And think about from a workload perspective, it's all of the things that are going on in your environment. Um, you know, all of the software, all the applications, all of your networking, everything that's going on inside of there. And that's where you're going to need things like, you know, Cisco Secure Cloud Analytics and Argento and, and things like that, where these are going to trust, you know, check that zero trust and help keep everything aligned. And last one is workplace. Uh, obviously, we need to secure the workplace as well, uh, whether it's secure network analytics or secure workload or, you know, all of our other networking access like ICE or DNAC or SD access. Uh, those are the things where we need to talk about securing our workplace. So you can be zero trust workforce. You can be zero trust workload or zero trust workplace. Uh, the most effective zero trust is going to be when we have zero trust across all three of those. Uh, because now you're securing the workforce, the workload, and the workplace. And those are also, I'm assuming, as you're out there talking to teams, there's a bit of a prioritization there too, right? And all of a sudden in the in the last, you know, 18 months or so, when you had so many more people working at home, well, now it's like we got folks on those endpoint devices at the house we gotta because some of those were machines that were just sitting in the closet for like three years all of a sudden hey we need something so they were thrown out there so those that needed to be checked the network now connection my kids on their xboxes and all these other things connecting to my network connecting to the partner companies that i were i mean there was all of a sudden all these issues and companies had to go back and forth and prioritize like what do we need to focus on here and now and it's it's a continuing as i see it it's not an end state. Zero trust is a process. Zero trust is a mindset. Zero trust is how things are just going to be for now on. It's not, okay, we're at zero trust. We can go on and do something else. The moment you do that and have that mentality, I think you're in, in, in big trouble. World of hurt. World of hurt. And, you know, and that, it, it kind of gave me a good transition there. We can kind of move to the next subject. But, you know, secure remote workers. How many people got sent home to work? but they use a desktop computer at the office. And so now they're connecting with their own personal laptop at home. Are you connecting through VPN? Is a VPN encrypted? Are you using multi-factor authentication, uh, both to reach your applications as well as to log into, uh, you know, credentializing yourself using two-factor authentication? You know, and so now secure remote worker, to your point, I've got my son on the Wi-Fi or, uh, uh, you know, Xboxes or, you know, well, my house is super busy and my, my internet connectivity is suspect. So I'm going to take my laptop and go all the way over to Starbucks and I'm going to have my quiet time with my coffee. Well, now I'm connecting to somebody else's Wi-Fi. Good luck with that. Yeah. So are we secure? You know, and so you just open up this gigantic Pandora's box. And again, if you put the right controls in place, and this is where we're going to move to sassy real almost transitionally. <laughs> Put the right controls in place, you know, you're going to have the right coverage and you're going to allow people to connect. Secure access service edge. Uh, guys, you're not going to go down to your corner Best Buy or your, your corner uh, IT store or your IT vendor and go, I want to buy Sassy. I need 36 Sassies, please. You don't buy Sassy. Sassy is a solution. It's a set of things. It's components. There, I remember where train of thought was going because it's you know, thinking about it from a SaaS based or software as a service, you know, everything isn't necessarily on premise anymore. So now I'm going to have to think about how do I secure access to those cloud applications? How do I secure access uh, across, you know, whether it's an employee into the, the applications or customers or potential, you know, connectivities. So talking about it from a SASE perspective, you know, it's, it's the three C's. So, First, it's about connecting users to the applications and the data that, and, and that they need. So we're talking about things like SD-WAN. You know, second is the control part or extending secure services from the data center to any cloud. 
<clears throat> excuse me, so now we're talking about things like zero trust, or we're talking about, you know, firmware as a service or firewall as a service. Uh, you're talking about CASB, you're talking about things like that where it's control. And the last one is converge. And that's I mean we're bringing it together networking and security functions to you know, deliver that secure connectivity in a more integrated fashion as a service. So again, you're not buying SASE, but what you're looking at is you're looking at an architecture. And that architecture is what you're seeing here now is you know, core components of you know, SASE architecture that uh, Cisco provides here is, you know, the the observability that comes in from Thousand Eyes on top of, you know, what we we're talking about with the connect, converge, and control. So Cisco not only gives you that complete visibility from the user to the application over any network, but it also gives insight into any performance issues, so you can remediate incidents quickly and maintain that, you know, reliable connectivity for everybody, uh, both your employees as well as public that are accessing your your uh, architecture there's a lot that goes into the the layers i, I think everyone's been seeing here and, and that's part of the story you're telling here adam is there's so many different layers right it's no and don't we all wish couldn't we all go back to the day that we just had to update our antivirus weren't those glorious days in, in the tech world one thing updated you're covered move on right do <clears throat> we've now got all these layers right and the idea is figuring out, well, do you, is it from here and from here and from here and from here? Is it one vendor giving us a lot here? Uh, do we focus on someone here? I mean, there's so many choices and thoughts that need to be made in one of the other aspects. And again, that's why this is a, uh, that, that, as you were saying, I think, great, you're not buying a sassy thing. It's a mindset. It's an architecture. It's where you're headed towards. It's what you, ultimately, it's an end type of state that, again, I think will continue to evolve because unfortunately these criminals continue to evolve. One of the components now uh, that's going to, I think, lead us to SASE and the SASE state is XDR. And I wanted to make sure I was getting the definition right, extended detection and response. And the idea is to, again, not have just that one place, but extending uh, this protection and evaluation across all of our data sources. Because that is what ultimately these criminals are after. That's why ransomware is a thing. They want to get to your data, say, ha ha, we got it. Give us money and we'll give it back. Uh, and we can have another conversation whether that happens or not and whether or not it's a good idea to pay the ransom. But as for this idea of XDR and extending the detection and extending uh, right the, the response to, okay, now we saw something, we have to mitigate it and deal with it. Talk a little bit about you know, the focus at Cisco and, and how this XDR concept plays into all these offerings from Cisco Secure. Perfect. Wow, my brain is transitioning through three major uh, ideas here. Let's do this one. Uh, integrated XDR, so extended detection and response. Uh, it's not necessarily, again, it's not a one and done by a product. It's usually the combination of different components coming together as one. So Secure Network Analytics, Cisco Secure Endpoint, and our platform SecureX. That's kind of the general premise of XDR, so we're extending beyond your typical detect and response. Let's take this back one level. So Cisco Secure Endpoint is an EPP or Endpoint Protection Program, and it's an EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response. Well, that's great. Um, the problem is that you're stuck in that telemetry of just whatever endpoint information gives you. And if you're only getting that very finite information, you do the best you can with what you have, and that's what the industry has done. You want to talk about, you know, you were talking a little bit ago about, you know, we had the yellow brand and the red brand back in the 90s, yeah. uh, and now there's there 2,300 different brands out there. But now as you look at it and, and you add in something like network analytics, now I'm starting to see additional telemetry. Who is talking to what and why and when? and where and what are they sharing and what data is going out and what's coming in. I'm increasing that telemetry. I'm increasing the amount of data sources that I can look at so that way we can make a better detection and better response plan, the DR part of it. Because now I'm able to look at what's going on network, what's going on endpoint, and using something like the Cisco SecureX platform 
So that way it brings all of that information together into one spot. So that way you can see it all together to make those informed decisions. You know, it gives you so much more horsepower in, in your ability to do, excuse me, that detection and response activities that you need to get done. So that's where this whole kind of XDR uh, premise is coming from. So it gives you that full visibility into threats beyond the endpoints. You know, it simplifies your investigation uh, with threat response. So now you're able to see where things are going and how they're interactive and they're interrelated. You know, with us, with Cisco, you're getting the opportunity to run, you know, automated playbooks and automated actions. And then you can obviously, like I said earlier, as you're in, you know, enable those better, faster decisions and pivots, you know, to relative context, you know, and analytics. So that's kind of XDR in a nutshell. And I'm ready and, to go and, deeper if we need to. Well, and, and, and what we knew in, in terms of, of talking a little more about these concepts, one, I'm assuming that, that most of the folks that are joining us, you've heard these concepts, right? These are ideas that you've been hearing out there and, and all. We wanted to go a, a little bit at a high level, but give you an idea of like, this is how they all play together. Because oftentimes I'm hearing people just talk sassy, but maybe not XDR. And so showing that there is this, uh, you know, they're, they're all tied together. And, and that I think is, is showing the complexity of where things are. And ultimately the, the end of the day, one of the reasons we have these conversations is that we hope you learn one or two things, right? It moves your knowledge a bit further down the road. Secondly, we hope then you start saying, maybe I should talk to so-and-so in my organization about this. But what, what do they know? What do they understand? And ultimately it leads to, hey, reaching out to Adam and his team and others at Cisco that can come in and talk to you and can say, hey, these, this is what we're seeing. These are the insights. We do work close with our Talos group. We, we hear from them. We have this insight. We can give you this broader picture that you, Mr. and Mrs. IT person that is stuck with just day-to-day -day keeping lights on too, you don't have laser vision on this. Adam and team have had that laser vision. So they can say, hey, let's pause for a second, see where you're at. Let's get you some priorities and how you can start, you know, getting a better security posture and all that. So with that, Adam, I know we've got a next step slide. Uh, folks, what we hope is there's some links tied to where this webinar has been hosted. So you'll be able to click on some of those things. But we do want you to get out there a 30 day trial that is available so you can uh, register for Cisco uh, Secure Endpoint. Again, we hope that uh, link is on the landing pages where you're getting this content. But Adam, talk me through a couple uh, uh, next steps here that you want people to thinking about action items, and then I'll give you an opportunity to take a minute or two, kind of recap everything uh, at a high level, and then we'll move people on for the day. Well, I, I'm gonna say thank you first and foremost for having me. This has been a blast. Uh, always a dream come true to work with you. Uh, so next steps, guys, real quick. Uh, and if you're struggling with this, Cisco Secure Endpoint, quick Google search or, or pick your browser choice search, uh, you can see in there the Cisco Secure Endpoint 30-day trial is there. Uh, you'll also have direct links from that as well to our, you know, view our latest XDR-based webinar series. So we're doing a webinar series. There's about seven webinars. Some of them are pre-recorded. You can catch up. Uh, and then the last one is sign up for a virtual threat hunting workshop. You actually get to put hands on and do some real kind of live threat hunting using the Cisco portfolio, not just Endpoint. So we've got some umbrella in there. We got some duo in there. We got some fun stuff in there that make this kind of a fun experience as well. So those are kind of the next step actions. Uh, closing thoughts are, are real simple, guys, because uh, I live in the world. It's make sure you're patching your stuff. Make sure you're up to date on your vulnerabilities. Make sure you're using a software that you truly trust when it comes to your security. And if you have doubts, you know, take a look at something else. Uh, I, I'm a security practitioner for all my life, and it's I'm with Cisco. But if if you're if you're looking at something, you know, if you're not happy, look at something else. You know, find that spot where you feel safe, secure, and comfortable. Uh, obviously, we talked about those three kind of main pillars of SASE, XDR, and zero trust. But think about that from your environment too. It's constantly evolving. You're never going to be one and done. Um, you know, your tires on your car need to be replaced, the oil needs to be changed, your security needs to be updated, your security needs to be advanced. Test it, put it to practice, make sure that you're, you're testing yourself as well for recovery or incidences in case they might need to occur. 
And then if you don't have the trust in your organization for that, don't be afraid to raise your hand and say help. Because the converse to this, like I said earlier on too, is you could get hit so badly with ransomware or, or something happens in your organization that you have to close up shop and walk away. Nobody wants you to have to deal with some sort of traumatic loss on a business like that. So take the time, you know, work through things, you know, hire out talent, whether it's somebody to manage your detection and response for you, or it's, you know, outsourcing your security as a whole. So, you know, think about how much the business means to you and how much you want it to succeed, and then take the steps necessary to, to make that happen. Cisco.com, of course, you can go to for more information. And then a phone number for all of you to jot down, 800-553-6387. 800-553-6387. So more information resources can be had there. Team would be happy to talk to you. Adam, final thoughts, and then we'll close things down. Guys, thank you for your time today. Thank you for your attention on this. Uh, you know, I end my everything I say with make it a great day. Absolutely. And, and I'll echo that. Folks, again, reach out Cisco.com. Phone number one last time for all of you. 800-553-6387. For Adam Tomio, I'm James Hilliard. The entire Cisco team thanks you for joining us. And we do look forward to talking to you all down the road. 